Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. You're on the I-95 Carter Coalition VTM Phase 2 update for ubiquitous traffic volume from curb data. Uh, just a few reminder uh, housekeeping items. You see the call information on your screen. Participants are in listen-only mode throughout this webinar. You can ask, uh, press star zero if you need to speak to an operator for some reason. And if you're having uh, web difficulties, you can get in touch with Justin Ferry by phone or by text at 484-557. 7009. This webinar is being recorded and the presentations will be posted to the I-95 Carter Coalition website a few days after the presentation and participants, you will receive a link to the presentation after and the Q&A after they are posted. So since we are in listen-only mode today, if you would like to ask a question, please pose it in the chat box. And in red on the screen, you will see an example of that. For example, if your question is to Stan Young, we would request that you type in at Stan, followed by your question. And when he will respond either verbally, as will the other, other uh, speakers, or we will type a response into the chat directed back to you. The questions will be monitored, and at the end of each presentation, we will respond. And with that, I would like to turn the uh, mic over to Denise Marco from the IND5 Carter Coalition. Thank you, Karen. Um, Denise, thank you all for, for joining. Thank you, Karen. Thank you for, thank, thanks to everyone for joining us today. The uh, VTM uh, technical team is going to share results and about this, what I call a longstanding mission to find a way to estimate real-time volumes. Uh, so I'm going to be brief in order to get to the presentations. But uh, first thing first, though, I thought I'd let me start with the slide to let you guys know that in the next few months, the coalition is going to be changing. Uh, we're changing our brand. We are no longer going to be known by the I-95 Corridor Coalition, but we're going to be known as the Eastern Transportation Coalition or uh, TET Coalition. Um, basically, our state members are growing. We've recently added Alabama and Tennessee. We've always had Vermont since the beginning, but all of all the all the members that are uh, outside of the strict 95 corridor were starting to grow. And, and basically, we're also ex expanding beyond the interstate, and we're working with other sections of the transportation network. So it really was time for a change. The, the switch is going to be targeted. It's targeted, the official switch, I should say, is targeted for July 1 to coincide with the change of the fiscal year. But between then and now, you're going to see some of the slow change taking place. But uh, this is the first real uh, slide to tell you we are changing. So with that being said, let me get to the agenda today. Uh, Dan Young is going to start with an overview and, and a little bit of the objectives. I think that this is our... 12th webinar, 10th steering, committee, 10th steering Committee webinar, and then we've had two other national webinars to talk about this project. But he has a slide or two just to bring us back to basics to say why we're doing this in the first place. He then is going to transfer over to Yi who, uh, to talk about a pilot study that was done in Pennsylvania with PennDOT in the Harrisburg area. And so Yi is going to go first, followed by Kave. They're both going to talk about the freeway results that, that, that took place in Harrisburg using different models. Uh, uh, and is using TomTom data. Kave is using INRIX data, and they'll be able to bring you their results. It's then going to be followed by Stan, who's going to talk about the results of a couple other pilots that they've done on lower class roads, particularly in Tennessee and North Carolina. And then we will uh, end up with a discussion questions and a wrap up after that. So as I mentioned before, we've had several large number registered. We have 22 states. And again, as you can see, there's a selection of different types of agencies that are interested in the uh, project that we're working on. So the last, uh, one of the last slides is there is in the box above the chat box a project profile. If you're interested, you can download it now. 
and have it with you, or it will also uh, accompany the, the follow-up email with the link to the presentation. But this is something that really talks about a little bit about what we're doing. Um, if you're interested in getting involved in a pilot study, uh, Stan's contact information there as well. Um, so either way, download it now or you'll get it with a link. And before I turn this over to Stan, I, I thought it was time. We haven't done this in a while. I just wanted to give you a little bit of a bio, a brief bio of each of these guys. Uh, who've been doing some great work with this project. Uh, Stan, obviously, Stan is the original, he's actually the original architect of the VPP marketplace, for those of you that buy pro data through there. He originally came from UMD. He now works at NREL. He is uh, an advanced transportation and urban scientist there. He joined uh, the center in 2015. And he manages the lab's research efforts. Um, and he also serves as the DOE's Department of Energy technologist in city for the Columbus Smart City Program. So he's He's a busy guy, he's got a lot on his plate. Yi is a data scientist in NREL Transportation and Hydrogen Systems Center. So he's got civil engineering degrees from the University of Missouri. His primary focus, though, has been on research revolving around machine learning and artificial intelligence and big data techniques. So he's going to be the guy spearheading the results from the Harrisburg pilot relative to NREL and TomTom. And lastly, Kave. Kave is a senior research research faculty at the University of Maryland. And he's been there for about 20 years. He's got his engineering through civil and engineering degrees from Maryland and from the University of Texas. And he's very much involved with um, several of Maryland SHA's projects. Also, he's done a lot of work with the coalition in the past and uh, for even Federal Highway. His main interests, though, are big data, analytics. He's even moving into connected and automated vehicle technologies. So with that being said, those are the three speakers for today. And I'm going to turn it over now to Stan Young. Stan, take it away. Thank you, Denise, for that uh, generous introduction. This is a brief sound check. Can you hear me coming through clearly? Hearing no response, I should I assume yes or yes. no? Yes. Thank you, Chris. You're cool. Fine. Okay, uh, I'm going to get a little uh, introductory material. This introductory material is somewhat neutral. As you know, we have two teams, University of Maryland and NREL, working on this through two parallel paths. Kind of friendly competition, but we compare technical notes frequently and take cues from each other. Uh, so all this material is equally applicable, whether it, it, we're talking uh, University of Maryland and NREL data or, or uh, um, NREL and TomTom data. Uh, why do we need better volume data? This, this, these are stock slides. I don't want to go over in detail. We're, we started an operation for uh, highway management. Planning got interested. There's economic and energy assessments that's coming from, uh, from my lab. You know, it's so vital right now. We're looking at the pandemic, and there's a slide or two associated with pandemic emphasis uh, here in this slide deck. Uh, whether it's our approach or or, or NREL's approach or UND approach, it, this I love this slide. It's on the left. This is our our uh, our high competence counters in in uh, Denver, Colorado. There's only 13 of them, and what we're trying to do is turning it into a map so we know the volume anywhere, everywhere. And this just shows freeways. We're getting off freeways and getting into the lower class roads. So just conceptually, we're trying to light up the whole network, and, and all the evidence shows that this is working and working well. Um, uh, both uh, any of these processes tend to take the same route. You have a bunch of input data. At the top of the input data list is, is probe traffic data. This is data from our, our data partners. Enrix and TomTom and others. Uh, the, the key one is reporting a number of probes seen. Right now, you'll hear later that we're seeing between 6% uh, and 13% on the freeways and roadway systems. And then we, we scale that up appropriately for appropriate estimates. Uh, it's not the only data by any means. We need road characteristics, weather information, temporal data, and so forth. Uh, all the new methods use use some type of machine learning or AI as opposed to classical statistics. So that's the big, uh, the, the crank that we turn in the output then is estimates. Most of it right now is hourly estimates everywhere on the roadway at all points in time. We're moving this to real time and we're moving this to sub-hourly as well as aggregating it up to AADTs and ADTs. Uh, but conceptually, this is the concept of through which all of them work. Uh, this is phase two of the project. Phase one was funded. Uh, the pure research grant through a multi-state, uh, through USDOT. Uh, phase two 
is, is the primary funding source is through NREL, through a technology commercialization grant through the DOE, and then University of Maryland is being supported through various means as well, most notably uh, Maryland State Highway Administration. And the big difference in phase two from phase one is we're trying to get it out of the lab and into the street, so to speak. Any one of these case studies we present to you, as in phase one, we would do the work and present. Here is how accurate it is based on laboratory results. Well, every one of the case studies, whether it be Chattanooga, Tennessee, Harrisburg, uh, or North Carolina, once we're done, it, it's merging with another effort. It might be another research study. It might be with the state DOTs, but we're getting the data that we produce and handing it off and, and it's being integrated into a larger effort, and we're getting good feedback that way. In fact, at the end, we're going to solicit, say, if there, there's room for a couple more case studies. One of the big parameters, if you volunteer, is you have to put the data to use and give us some meaningful feedback so that we can uh, move this ahead. Um, you'll be presented with a ton of accuracy numbers here, both from Yi and Kumkabe. Uh, we both use the same cross-validation technique. This is an industry standard technique. We take all our input data and divide it into bins or buckets. Uh, say 10 bins or buckets, we reserve a tenth of those, that data, set it aside and run the whole process on the other nine, and then compare it to the tenth to see how accurate we are. And then we iterate it, take a different 10% every time. Uh, and that's how we, we come up with these accuracy estimates. Uh, this, this is quite standard. Sometimes it's 10% of the data, sometimes 20, sometimes 1 in 5, things like that. You'll also be hit with a ton of metrics. And these aren't the only four. These are the four that we've consistently reported on through phase one and into phase two. And I know there's more coming out of the woodwork. Uh, Yi has a, another one called a W mate instead of an S mate. Uh, but these are the four. The air to maximum flow ratio, or EMFR, is one that, that tends to be constant. It, it tells you what is the air relative to the maximum flow observed on the roadway. Uh, and then R squared, if you're a statistician, mean absolute air. Traffic engineers know that well. And then the symmetric mate, or mean absolute percentage air, is one that, that's, that's, I'm not saying it's industry standard, but we've settled on and try to report consistently. Uh, as far as where do we need to be, uh, th this isn't set in stone, but as we're going through this, um, two things in the R squared realm and in the uh, air to maximum flow ratio realm. You know, on freeways, we like to see R squared 90% or better. We like to see EMFR 5% or less. Then once you get off freeways, as you go down in road class, uh, it'll scale down accordingly. The accuracy will get worse. So, but we need to work to start to begin to bracket that as we're doing more and more work off freeways. Uh, we're, at, we're doing a better job of understanding where we want to be within the uh, accuracy realm. Um, kind of as a warm-up before I turn it over to the heavy hitters who will go through in detail the results from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. We thank very much uh, Pennsylvania DOT for stepping up, raising their hand, and saying we want to put this to work. Um, if you take a look, it, I, I set up this parallel matrix uh, so you can understand kind of a shortcut. Uh, for the data input, NREL was using TomTom, uh, University of Maryland is using NREX. The, the data comes in slightly differently, but the same character and nature in the end. Uh, the model region, uh, NREL approached it as, as a Harrisburg metropolitan uh, region. University of Maryland did a statewide model and then self-selected the Harrisburg out of that. And there, there's some um, unique uh, insights as a result of that that we're, we're interacting with, and we think Admiral is going to do something somewhere in the future for a couple of reasons. Uh, the calibration validation source, the input is all the same. It's the continuous count station uh, that was made available to us through Pennsylvania DOT. We also have access to the temporary count stations, which will come into play, uh, currently being used, but uh, we don't have results yet as far as getting down to the lower flash roads. Uh, the model type are both machine learning AI models, uh, if you're into that language. Uh, the probe mix, if you take a look for TomTom, -tom, it's primarily light-duty vehicles. When you get into to NRICS, they have a mixture of both light, medium, and heavy-duty vehicles. And if you look at the penetration rate, this is the number of vehicles seen versus the total population of vehicles out there. TomTom's uh, -tom's coming in around 12% our average. Uh, NRICS is in the 6 to 7% range. Now, that's all the upfront data, and this will get reinforced and talked in detail uh, next. But the results and, and the takeaway from these two is the freeway, re, freeway results that we're getting in Harrisburg is comparable, consistent with the results and performance we've seen in other areas that we've tested, whether that's Colorado or Florida or Maryland. 
they're all coming in right around 5% EMFR. That's their, our first statistics, and above 90% R squared. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to our first speaker, Yi. I hope this is all queued up, and you can take it over from here. All right. Yeah, thank you, Stan. Um, yeah, I'm going to, so for the next 15 minutes, I'm going to present the results uh, from Unreal uh, for the volume estimation in the Harrisburg, Pennsylvania area. Um, okay. Uh, so these, these are the inputs uh, for our model. Uh, we use a TomTom -tom vehicle probe data, which includes the vehicle probe counts and the hourly uh, average speed, um, as well as other information like weather, road characteristics, and the temp temporal information. Um, and these are the data we use to train our model. We collect the data on eight um, continuous count stations in the, in the Harrisburg area from July 1st to December 31st uh, in 2018. We have a round of uh, 57,000 observations uh, totally uh, in this region. Uh, we have six, um, six continuous count stations um, from freeways, uh, from interstate uh, and okay. from freeway and expressway. Hello? Uh, and one from principal arterial. Uh, so if you look at the feed on the right side, this shows the average traffic volume um, at each station. You can see the highest uh, traffic volume would be uh, around 2,000 vehicles per hour on average. Um, we also detect some anomalies um, while processing the data. Uh, it happens on the station 701. Uh, then we plot both northbound and southbound traffic. You can see on the south, southbound after July 23rd, uh, the pattern has shifted. Uh, and if you compare with the northbound, the northbound is still uh, has the same pattern as, uh, as before. Uh, so we have a reason to believe that there must be have some uh, error, uh, like a measurement error happened after, after that data point. So we discard the, the data um, of the Sound at a station 701 of the training. And this is the distribution of the traffic volumes um, for, for this region. Uh, you can see uh, around 6% of the hourly volumes are less than 250 weeks per hour. 61% uh, of the hourly volumes are greater than 1,000 weeks per hour. Um, so it's a typical freeway interstate um, traffic volumes distribution. And this slide, we show the, um, the mean volume and the penetration rates uh, by different road classes. So if you look at the figure on the left, that's the that's average uh, traffic volume by different road classes. Um, you can see the freeway and interstate has higher traffic than the principal arterials. Well, on the uh, right side, uh, this figure shows that uh, the penetration rates on interstate freeway is also higher than the principal arterials. And uh, this, this, is, uh, this is expected. And this slide shows the, uh, our results for the volume estimation. Uh, the, left, the figure on the left side shows a, is a, is a plot of a uh, predicted volume or estimated volume versus the actual volume. So in an ideal situation, um, like if the, if the model can estimate the traffic volume with zero errors, 100% uh, accuracy, all the dots should be aligned on the 45 degree lines. Uh, so if you, now if you look at our model, most of the dots are scattered around this 45 degree lines, shows that the model uh, was trained very well and uh, it's not a bias, um, it, it, it fits very well. And uh, you can look at, look at other measures like R square, of 0.91 and a, a mean absolute error of uh, 194 vehicles per hour made around the 17% uh, error to maximum flow ratio is, is about a 5.7%. Um, so if you remember what a stem presents, um, so if the error to maximum flow ratio is less than 5%, uh, it should be usable. So we are around that 
ballpark. Um, and the, the advantage of this model is that it can also show which variables are important uh, during the estimation. Um, as you see in this in this figure on the right side, uh, it shows that probe counts, uh, number of lanes, hour, uh, longitude, like geographic information, uh, delf week, and months also they all have a um, some influence on the volume estimation. Okay, this figure shows the uh, error to maximum flow ratio error um, regarding to different volume range. Um, so you can see the error would fluctuate around 6% uh, for all the volume ranges. And this slide shows that um, we, we just randomly picked a few um, weeks to plot the uh, actual observed volume uh, versus versus the uh, estimated volume. And these are the these two weeks are the uh, are the scenarios with really low error. You can see uh, the pre the estimated volume almost e exactly the same as those as the observations uh, for the whole two weeks. And the next slide will present some scenarios with, with high errors. Um, as you can see, even though we cannot uh, estimate the, uh, exactly the same traffic volume, we can capture the, the general trend. And it also aligns with uh, the observed volume uh, very well. They are still in close agreement. Then we uh, estimate the whole, the Chapter volume for the whole region uh, on the interstate, freeway, and the uh, arterials, and the plot um, the traffic in different of different time of the day. Uh, so this is 1 a.m., which is midnight. You can see very light traffic in this in this region. And now is the uh, 5 p.m., which is the evening peak. So you can see the the traffic uh, gets much heavier um, than the midnight. And we also did some COVID-19 impact. Uh, we, we compared just uh, two days of traffic. One is August 30th, 2018, uh, which is just a regular uh, regular day. And both of those uh, traffic estimates are, are 8 a.m., which is a morning peak. Then if you look at the COVID-19 um, period, April 1st, 2020, you can see the traffic has uh, dropped significantly uh, during the morning peak. And that's all from Enrio. Um, and then now I get back to uh, uh to present the Maryland results. Yeah, thank, thank you, Yi. Um, just doing a quick sound check to make sure everybody's hearing me. Apparently there are some you know, audio uh, problems in the background. Um, Tabek, uh, we can hear you, but if you could hold for one second. Um, there are a couple of questions that are in the chat box specifically for towards um, Yi's presentation, and I think it might be easier to respond to them verbally. Absolutely. Okay. So um, Josh Roll asks, uh, Yi, um, how do you think lat long is being used by the machine, uh, machine learning, and would it work as a covariate for application? Yes, sometimes the, the long series, last series will uh, have a have an effect on the volume estimation based on, you know, because the long series, last series can capture some of the geographic uh, information, like for this case in Harrisburg. Um, if you if I go back to that uh, slide, yeah. So you see the long series would uh, should have ex uh, uh, effect on the volume estimation because either in the downtown area it, it can differentiate whether uh, that that area is a downtown area or is a suburban area. Uh, so during the model training, uh, 
the model would recognize whether this area is in downtown or in the suburban, or if there's a lot of, uh, um, you know, uh, business activities for the residential area. So, uh, yeah, longitude latitude would have a um, effect, effect on the volume estimation. Thank you, Yi. Um, Sanhita asks, if you could further explain the variance during peak hours, it seems from the slide that it is not even. The variance during peak hours, um, like the, the observation or the estimation. Um, let me see. Are, are you talking about it here, the variance peak hours? Um, Uh, yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, it it depends. It depends on the real uh, traffic. Sometimes there are like a, maybe some special events. If there is no no storm or something happened, the uh, you know the peak hour pattern would uh, be shifted. Uh, so sometimes you just don't know what what happened. But uh, uh, the model can still capture those those variants based on you know those input data like probe counts, speed. Uh, weather information. So if, if you look at the figure in the bottom, you can see every day the pattern shifted a little bit, but the model can still capture those uh, those events. I don't know what happens here, like on the on Saturday, uh, from fr on Friday, uh, you can see there's a drop maybe around the evening peak, but uh, yeah, the model can still capture those. And hopefully I answer your question. Um, hey, Yi, this is uh, Stan. I was going to cut in and show the next slide because it somewhat uh, reflects with the COVID-19. Okay. Uh, we, we didn't point out when we talked through it, if you look at the Tuesday-Wednesday period where it performed poorly, that happens to be Christmas. Uh, is it Christmas Day or Christmas Eve? I can't remember which. Uh, so, you know, the, the patterns of traffic greatly differ on those days uh, where the, the, the model tends to estimate a, a more predictable pattern. That's something that we're looking into. And it plays into those COVID-19 estimates. Uh, Yi, you could perhaps respond to that. I'll say mm -hmm. simply that our current model reflected a large change in volume. Uh, but to get more accurate, we would probably have to calibrate across the the, the period of the pandemic. Uh, Yi, do you have any other thoughts with respect to that? Yeah, yeah. I think that right now we just uh, apply the, the model that trained using 2018 data and then uh, apply to that data we collected in 2020. Um, we, somewhat we, we captured the, the trend of the, the drop of the, um, you know, the traffic volume around this area. But uh, if you want to, uh, maybe we can calibrate with 2020 uh, continuous count station data and see, uh, see how big the error is. Uh, but the best way is to use the most recent data to, uh, to estimate traffic volume in this region uh, because to, uh, 2018, there's like two-year lag. During those two years, maybe there are some economic development uh, growth, so maybe population growth, traffic growth. Uh, we cannot capture those those factors, uh, but we can still capture the trend. Um, yeah, definitely. If the, uh, I think using the most recent data can give you better results. And there's one last question. What platform was used for modeling? How many months were used in testing? Okay, um, so we use a we use a um, the platform maybe Python. We use a, a machine learning package called a um, called a SideKit and a XG Boost. Uh, that's a, the name of the model. Um, we use uh, use six months of model to train and. A, during the cross-validation, which means we're using the uh, six months of data to, to validate or to, to test. Okay, great. So I think all the questions um, on your presentation have been answered, Yi. Thank you very much, and Stan. And um, we right, can now you. move on. Sure, great, thanks. Now we can move on to um, Kada. Hopefully you are uh, still connected. Just for everyone's information, um, it looks like Adobe Connect is having some system issues. So m most of us have already lost connection and you'll get reconnected. So 
uh, hopefully that won't um, be too much of a problem. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Sure. Uh, thank you. Thanks, everybody. Um, so, yeah, this is the you know, summary of uh, results uh, we got, um, you know, from you know, applying the, the methodology to um, the data set we, we got from uh, INRIX uh, for the greater Harrisburg area. Two of my colleagues, uh, Perjamis Sakula and Zach Wanderlon, you know, they did the technical work, and I'm here just to present the results. Um, just wanted to give them credit uh, for the great work. Um, so the data source, just uh, giving you a, a brief um, overview of, of the data and what's in it. Um, uh, it belonged to three months of data in two, uh, three months of uh, 2018, June, July, and August. Uh, and you know, as, men as Stan mentioned earlier, um, we uh, you know, received the uh, full uh, state data. So every single trajectory that had at least one waypoint inside the state of Pennsylvania during that three months period um, was, was included um, in that data set. At, uh, it comprised uh, 44.5 million trips uh, for that three months. Um, the penetration rate that we uh, calculated based on this new data set um, in terms of the median, um, of course, it's different from um, you know, different at different locations at different times, but uh, in terms of the median, we are seeing a uh, six to seven percent penetration rate. Uh, it can go up to twenty percent, uh, as you see uh, on the uh, colored uh, map uh, to the um, bottom right corner of the slide. Um, and interestingly, uh, this is uh, almost threefold. Um, you know, the penetration rate uh, that we, was, we, we were seeing in the previous data set. So there's been a, a large increase in um, in the number of uh, probes and trajectories that are being captured, um, at least by, by INRIX. Um, in terms of the um, you know, distribution of, um, of, of the trajectories coming from different uh, vehicles and different weight classes, uh, this data set was more balanced. So almost one third of uh, data is coming from uh, light duty trucks and cars. One third is coming from uh, medium trucks and one third is coming from uh, heavy duty trucks, uh, which is also different from uh, previous data sets. Um, the probe speeds um, is coming again from INRIX, and we're using uh, road characteristics uh, extracted from HPMS and OSM maps. Uh, we're using uh, archived weather data and also temporal information. Uh, for calibration and testing, um, we are using uh, traffic counts. Um, that you know, was given to us uh, you know, by, by PennDOT. Uh, it includes both um, continuous count of stations and short-term uh, counts from, from various locations you know, throughout the state. Uh, if you look at the, um, the, the network, um, and you know, I have to mention that the network that we were uh, working with was um, you know, in, in some ways limited. Um, it didn't think include all the uh, all the roads, all, all the uh, lower class class roads in inside the uh, state, and also the uh, you know region of the study. Um, but you know, uh, looking at what we had, um, um, you know the. The bar charts on the slides show the uh, distribution of um, different, uh, you know, TMC segments belonging to each road class uh, in the state and also in the greater Hatchback area. Um, you know, primarily the network is comprised of uh, FRC 1 to 3 uh, in this case. And inside the, you know, Harrisburg region, mostly we are dealing with FRC 1 and 2s. Uh, that's, that's what uh, can be, um, you know, seen here. Um, and of course, FRC one and two obviously are interstates and uh, freeway expressways, and also uh, principal arterials, mainly um, higher class roads. That's what uh, the target and the focus of our analysis has been. Uh, where the uh, continuous counter stations are located, um, that you know, uh, to some extent. Um, uh, 
you know, tells the story and, you know, um, you know, provides justification why we went uh, with the statewide training rather than focusing on uh, the stations inside the Harrisburg for training. So statewide, uh, we have 77 continuous council stations, uh, which, you know, provided uh, almost 200,000 hours of, of data. Um, and, um, you know, as you see here, um, mostly, you know, the, the council stations are on FRC 1 to 3, uh, with majority of them being on FRC 1 and 2. Inside the uh, Harrisburg region, uh, we have only 35,000 hours uh, of data, and uh, we're dealing with only 10 continuous counter stations, seven of which are on uh, FRC1s. Um, so uh, given the fact that, you know, the, the network that we're dealing with, you know, has a lot of two, uh, FRC2 and 3s, um, and the continuous counter stations inside the, um, the, the region are mostly on FRC1s, uh, we decided to do the training on the statewide and do the testing uh, and application uh, inside the Harrisburg region. Uh, this is the uh, slide that you know, gives you a summary of all the um, you know error metrics that we uh, we obtained as a result of our um, application. Uh, the median uh, overall R square is 0.9. MAPE uh, is 14 percent. MAPE uh, is 14 percent again, and error to maximum flow ratio uh, is less than six percent. Um, so um, all of the numbers are within the acceptable, acceptable range. You know the tables on this slide also provide you know, um, you know the metrics uh, for different road classes, uh, for different different average pro counts per hours, and for different hourly volumes. Um, in general, as you see. Um, the higher the road class of the road is, you know, uh, the accuracy of the model in terms of the um, accuracy of estimates uh, is, is better. And, you know, typically uh, with, with higher um, hourly volumes, um, you know, the accuracy uh, is, is better. Uh, but, of course, you know, there are some exceptions to this rule, but in general, uh, statistically speaking, um, you know, all uh, higher road classes, FRC 1, 2, 3, and 4, um, we, are, we are doing uh, just fine. Uh, to give you a um, better uh, visual of you know, how the um, observations uh, and estimates compare against each other, um, this slide you know, has two um, you know, histograms. The, the one to the left is the histogram of hourly volume observations um, you know, at the continuous counter stations. Um, you know, as you see, there is, um, you know, the range and also the frequency of uh, observations in each range, in each bean of, uh, of volumes uh, shown, you know, on the y-axis. Um, compared to that, in the middle of the slide, uh, there is a histogram uh, of the uh, estimated volumes. Uh, for the continuous counter stations inside the greater Harrisburg area. Uh, as you see, there is uh, good, um, you know, uh, consistency between the two. And note that, you know, the, the y-axis on the one in the middle is a little bit different, so the scale is, is different. But um, when you do the side-by-side -side comparison, um, the, um, you know, the, the, the estimates are, uh, are, are you know, comparatively, um, you know, uh, very, uh, very near the uh, number of observations in each group. Of course, there are some overestimates and underestimates also, but uh, they are all in tolerable range. Uh, more importantly, um, to the uh, right of the slide, uh, there is a scattergram of estimates versus, um, versus observations. Um, in the ideal case, when the model is you know, uh, working perfectly, you know, everything should fall on the, the 45 degree line, but in reality, of course, you know, uh, we, we are uh, we're not. Uh, so this graph um, shows the density of um, number of um, number of data points uh, in each at each location. And the darker uh, the color is, uh, it shows the um, higher concentration of data points there. So as you see, uh, by order of magnitude, you know there are um, more reddish and darker colors, you know, close to 45 degree lines. Uh, so this is a good indication that, you know, the, the model is uh, producing, um, you know, 
more um, more accurate um, you know estimates than non-accurate estimates uh, in in each case. And this is um, again only for Greater Harrisburg area. Uh, when you look at the statewide results, um, you know things are much better. Um, so you know in terms of the comparison between the histograms, you know uh, in, in uh, observations and estimates, uh, there is a very good match uh, between you know the the two sets of numbers. And also in terms of the scattergram, um, uh, again um, we are we're doing fine. You know there there are a lot of data points near the 45 degree line. Uh, which indicates uh, you know, close um, uh, estimation uh, to the estimations are very close to the observations. So here we have a um, we have a uh, animation uh, that that shows the um, uh, first of all color coded map of the um, you know uh, of the region, uh, you know, hour by hour, you know, the the colors are indicating the uh, the hourly volume that's estimated, uh, you know, throughout the region. And uh, for one uh, single continuous count station, that's shown. Uh, Indicated by that star on the map, uh, we are showing the estimate versus um, versus observation for uh, for both directions of travel at that at that location. As you see, there is good uh, good agreement between estimate uh, or what we call you know uh, predicted in this um, in this graph uh, against the actual observations. And this is you know, hour by hour you know going throughout the three months of uh, data that uh, that we were working with. Thank you. Um, well, we, um, as a result of our uh, analysis, we uh, we had uh, estimated hourly volumes. So obviously, if we aggregate the hourly volumes, we can estimate the AADTs and AWDTs. Um, this slide shows two maps uh, that are um, you know color coding the uh, results of this that that process. Um, so uh, in terms of the MAPE and SMAPE, um, you see the, the metrics are reported here for, for both measures. And um, you know, based on our you know, internal analysis and comparison with the numbers you know, from, from PennDOT, uh, we see that we are in good agreement in terms of the ADT estimates with um, uh, the numbers that are uh, that are collected uh, at, at these locations and also the, the routes that are carrying you know, higher volumes uh, also match the uh, you know the the consensus and also the uh, the understanding of the of the region and the type of roads that are um, you know in in the network. So all in all, it's, it it seems um, you know we are we are doing a fine job uh, estimating the ADTs and AWDs uh, using this approach. Um, just uh, wanted to also mention uh, that you know um, aggregating the hourly volumes to a, a daily level. Uh, if you know the estimates are not biased, which in in, in our case uh, that's that's true, um, we have positive errors, negative errors. You know, summation um, is expected to um, to cancel out the errors. So uh, AADTs uh, tend to uh, be, be a better, uh, uh, you know, uh, enjoy better uh, accuracy than than hourly uh, estimates in general. So with that, um, I think I'm uh, I'm done. Um, this is the basically um, giving you an overview of the two approaches, um, you know, between um, what NREL you know has, has done and what UMD has done, and Stan has uh, gone through this uh, earlier. Um, I'll be happy to answer any questions uh, at this point. Otherwise, I'm I'm ready to give it back to uh, to Stan. 
Um, there's a couple of questions that came in, Kave. Uh, some of our yeah. cohorts have been answering it in the uh, in the chat session. Uh, but uh, there was one about uh, real time versus non real time. Is the model being retrained based on the inference or live results and predictions? Uh, uh, I was going to get to that, but go ahead and explain the the historical nature of of these models that were currently in operation in Harrisburg. Yeah. So. Um, if, if I understand it correctly, um, maybe the you know the interest is you know in um, using you know the results for uh, you know operations. Um, so at this point, um, no, the you know the the work we are doing uh, is based on um, archive data, historic data. Um, you know since um, you know the uh, you know the real time you know, application of of this. Um, of this method you know, requires um, live APIs and you know, um, you know a lot of different um, you know data layers that need to be um, you know, provided in real time. You know both in terms of the um, you know number of uh, probe counts, you know the weather um, information, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, so at this point, no, it's not there. Um, this is you know, primarily you know, based on you know, historic data. But once the model is is calibrated. Um, and we've we've done it. Um, we've done some some tests to see you know the model that's calibrated on one data set. You know later on, if you take the same model and apply it to another another data at a later time or, or even at a different geography, you know the, the performance has been has been very good. Uh, so you know our approach in in using machine learning, you know it seems uh, it's working, and you know the model seems to be really learning uh, the, the the relationship between you know the, the input data and you know the desired um, output, uh, which is the hourly counts. Um, so the model can be used in in, in production and in, in real time. Uh, given you know, uh, as I said, you know, uh, real time APIs for number of probes and you know weather and and so on and so forth. I, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, kind of summing up, we're more limited by input data getting to real time. Nothing in the the modeling frameworks or construct or con constructions prevent its application. Uh, there's been several questions coming in more detail with respect to the machine learning models. Can you provide a little bit more uh, specificity with respect to the the neural network models instituted by UMD? Yeah, sure. We are using. Um you know, artificial neural network, um, and um, you know, we are we are using different different types of architecture for um, neural nets, um, using different you know type of learning um, algorithms. Uh, the tools we are using are you know cutting edge, you know TensorFlow, and you know all sorts of you know advanced um, Python libraries. Uh, for this purpose, um, if you need more more information, more details, you know, we'll be happy to to provide that. Yeah, the question came kind of came in: Why is UMD using neural networks and and NREL using uh, a tree learning XG boost? Uh, I don't know if there's a direct answer to that, but we we both are we we both tried several things and, and kind of gravitated each to what we thought worked best. Uh, uh, we, we have yet to get to a point where saying, hey, one, one type of modeling works better in some circumstances than another. They, they both just seem adequate, and they're, they're both much more efficient than applying old statistical regression models at, at this current time. Cool. Uh, Kaveh, thanks for uh, handing it off. If you have any more specific questions for either team, feel free just to reach out an email or even a phone call, and we'll talk through it. We try to gauge these presentations at the appropriate level of depth uh, to, 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 to generate follow-on discussion both at the application level as well as at the detailed uh, technical level, and we hope we've struck that. Um, again, this is a follow-up. This may be more meaningful now that you've listened to Kave and Yi. Uh, the data inputs from two different companies, and they're slightly different flavors, but they bring uh, similar things to the table. Um, the model region, uh, this is one that's kind of a highlighted here where where uh, NREL took a region-specific model, UMD took a state-specific model, and 
and, and we're comparing notes in the background, the, the good and the bads of that. Uh, calibration validation sources, uh, all continuous count stations. Um, keep that in mind. There's a question on how we calculate penetration rates. It's, it's always observed number of probes versus the numbers reported at the continuous count stations. Uh, different types of learning models, uh, different types of probe mix, different penetration rates, uh, but in the end, on the higher class roadways, FRCs 1, 2, and 3, we're getting good comparable results. We may tweak it a little bit, bit you know, nudge that air down a half percent or something like that, uh, but all in all, this, this is working and working well. I got a few other notes uh, for other side projects. Uh, we are working on off freeway. Uh, it's about half baked, I should say. Uh, we contemplated showing some results, but we backed off because there were some mainly data issues involved. Uh, this slide more or less shows the contrast. We're trading off continuous count stations for a very large number of temporary counts coming in. Uh, the good news is those temporary counts have much better representation across many more road classifications. Uh, the bad news is, is there's a lot more data uh, quality issues that we have to take into account. Uh, this takes a look at functional class, uh, the mean volumes. Uh, do keep in mind as you go down in functional class, you have less and less volume to work with. If you have less and less volume, you have less and less probes, so you're constantly fighting a statistical battle. But a little less, less talked about is as you go down in functional class of volume, your probe penetration rate also goes down. Uh, it, particularly when you get to the local seeing these are numbers from TomTom, -Tom, uh, same thing, we're seeing the same thing with NRICS. And, and what we're thinking is once you get down to the minor collectors and locals for, for a number of reasons, uh, one of them that we hypothesize is uh, personal privacy. A lot of the, the probe data providers, once you get near your home locations, tend to truncate off the data simply to protect privacy. Uh, so, so, you know, whether we ever get to local roads or not is, is, is going to be an uphill battle for reasons outside of our control. But once you get to minor collectors forward, we, we see healthy pen probe penetration rates. Uh, again, the volume, uh, this is most informative if you contrast these lower class roadways to the, to the functional class 1, 2, and 3, and, and just emphasizing and putting an exclamation point that, that we're in mean hourly volumes at 500 vehicles per or or so less, uh, so much more difficult. We were going to present results, but we put a big old wait sign on it. Um, and, and there's a reason that we put that. There's some challenges in lower class roadways that we are tackling. And I wanted to kind of summarize what those challenges were. Um, a lot of this has to do with the input data, switching from continuous count stations, which are well maintained, have a, a large uh, budget for, for maintenance to, to a, a large, input set of temporary counts. Uh, some of the, the quality control issues is on the temporary counts, some of them are bidirectional, some of them are unidirectional, and that kind of breaks our framework, and we're working through that right now. Um, I, I asked the, the team to add in that, that station 701. Even on continuous counters, sometimes we get bad, bad data. Well, when we, we switch to a whole host of, of temporary counts, uh, filtering out the bad data becomes even more challenging, so we're working through that. Uh, and I already mentioned low penetration, uh, low penetration rates. And, and as you go down in the total number of volumes, uh, you get, you know, and you get a larger variation in volumes, it becomes a bit more challenging. All that being said, UMD and NREL are working on this. As I said, they're about half baked. Uh, expect the next uh, time we get together to present both the results on lower class roadways as well as the approaches to overcome some of these uh, difficulties. Uh, a lot of it has to do with data quality. Um, I was going to give you some updates. In previous uh, presentations, we touched on some North Carolina and uh, results that NREL was doing. Uh, we continue to be to, to work on that. Uh, North Carolina is one of our case studies, and it's being dovetailed into a larger interest range of, of can this probe data be used effectively for planning, specifically AADTs and ADTs, and why is North Carolina that way? North Carolina has more and a broader spectrum of continuous count stations across many more road classes than about any other state. Uh, FHWA clued that into us. If you take a look in the upper right and look at where the continuous count stations are, uh, you know, typically we see them on the first three, uh, and then once we get down to the lower class, we're lucky to have one or two, but this seems to have a healthy representation across all of them. Uh, we're working originally on a July through December data set. We're going to open this up into an entire year so we can do some apples to apples comparison on planning level estimates, and we hope to bring that forward in the, within this year. 
the results uh, are were very similar, particularly on the, on the freeway results. So these are consistent with what we share today. And we were even able to evoke some, um, some, some issues. I think that's the next slide. Yes, if you take a look at the compare and contrast in the upper two right-hand pictures, this was, was during Hurricane uh, Harvey. Uh, what a typical 8 a.m. look like versus what an 8 a.m. look like during the, the hurricane uh, hurricane event. Uh, so take a look at that there. We also did some off freeway results uh, because they were there's so many continuous counters off freeways. We didn't have nearly the challenge of of data quality input, and, and we're able to get good results even uh, into the lower class roadways. Again, that's a, a, a top level view. All those are kind of memorialized in slide sets from about three to six months ago. And we'll continue to move that forward, and then in future um, future presentations, provide more detail, particularly on using this as a test case for planning level accuracy. I think I just talked through all of those, uh, so I'm going to just skip over. Uh, Chattanooga is another case study that we're doing. The results from Chattanooga are being dovetailed into a, D a Department of Energy uh, larger research project where they're creating what they call a digital twin, a live tool to both monitor and predict traffic and the energy and traffic into the future. Uh, so we're gl glad to do that. So they're taking our results and putting them to the test and defining where, where they work well and where they fall short. Uh, here's some information related. The unique thing about Chattanooga is we do not have any continuous count stations. Uh, we're, we're relying wholly on, uh, <clears throat> on uh, uh, temporary counts, even though this says number of continuous count stations. This this, this actually means the freeway operational counters coming in, operational information. Uh, so I don't want to confuse you there. These are not uh, continuous count stations in the HPMS sense of the word. Um, we, we have consistent results coming out of, of um, Chattanooga, but just not at the level of quality that we're used to. If you're taking a look at the freeway, we're getting R squareds in the, in the 0.8 to 0.77 range. We're used to seeing these at 0.9 and above. And we're also getting EMFRs larger than, than what, you know, what we'd expect for the same class of roads. And again, it's working through the data quality issues. It's the primary challenge, and those are in active, active, uh, active work currently. Um, the particular note, what we're seeing in Chattanooga, which is front and center, is going to dovetail into some of the issues that we're looking at in, once we get off the, the higher class roadways in Harrisburg. And so those two will move together in tandem, uh, sharing notes across both teams moving forward. So those are the status updates and the other two. Um, turning it over to Denise, uh, kind of an advertisement. We, we still have room in this, this phase two. We have three case studies. I think we have room for a couple more case studies moving forward. Again, if you're interested, we've been chatting with a lot of folks. Uh, the, the primary element is the getting the base data in those areas and then working with uh, the UMB team and the NREL team to to both apply the methodology as well as to use a test case, whether that's for operations, whether that's for, for a digital twin, whether that's for long-term planning. Uh, we really want to stress once we, we uh, apply a case study, we turn the data over to somebody else and they, and they put it through the paces. So with that, Denise, I'll turn it back over to you. And Well, there is silence on the phone. Um, Denise, this is Karen. Is your line muted, perhaps? Okay, yeah, well, my, um, no, no, I'm, here. I'm here. My line was muted, and I apologize. My line was muted as I'm talking away here. Uh, thank you, Stan. I was going to say that the pilot studies, if there are some states that are interested in looking at how this was done and what, what, what goes into it, uh, the project brief has Stan as the contact. You can also con feel free to contact me, and we can work through and give you the steps that are involved in doing that. Uh, one other piece of information, Kave and Stan, while I'm talking, would you kind of look through the chat box right now and see if there's any questions that are still not answered? One of the key components that we will be doing is we do a Q&A, so because this presentation is recorded, we will take these questions. If there was a question that was not answered, and we will send that out to the speakers to be answered. Um, we are going to also, if you will keep this line open for typically about 10 minutes afterwards, 
If you want to put a question in the chat box that you didn't have a chance to do, please do so. We'll get an answer and we'll put it out with the Q&A. It will go out in the email um, with the link to the audio and the, the slides. Um, but other than that, um, do you I did. Have any, uh, go ahead, Stan. Yeah, there was one question that really sparked a, a thought. Uh, Linda put it in. It says, how accurate are the estimated volumes during periods of non-recurring congestion, such as incidents and crashes, as compared to times of recurring congestion? Um, speaking at the very top level, uh, we understand that this process works best for recurring congestion for highly repeatable events. That being said, every time we get results, we zoom in to, to, to anomalies. Uh, those anomalies may be an accident, maybe a snowstorm, uh, maybe the pandemic, uh, uh, and I showed you one where it was actually Christmas Eve. It wasn't an anomaly. It was just uh, totally unusual. Uh, we are working towards, we, we need a new metric. We understand how these metrics work, and they work best in, in a recurring congestion type sense. Uh, not only do we need a new metric saying, hey, identify the non-recurring events. Let's highlight the six events during the six-month time period that are most uh, anomalous or most out of the ordinary uh, but also working on ways to tweak the methodology so it recognizes, hey, this is not a normal Tuesday. Let's switch to a more appropriate uh, means. So expect to hear about more about that in the next six months. This is some early on thoughts that that both teams are are approaching, saying now that we seem to get the. The, the repeatable pattern type things down quite well. How do we switch that over to say what would it look like at the next presidential inauguration where having lived in D.C., we know everything is, is quite unusual for about a 24, 48-hour period. Great. Thanks, Dan. Anything else you guys see in the, in the chat box? I think Tom Ettinger said, are those new penetration rates going to be included in the study? I think you just answered that. No? All right. Dan and Kave, I think um, we've come to the end of the uh, presentations, the end of the questions. Um, Yi, Dan and Kave, I need to thank you guys for some, some really great work. I, I know the coalition sponsors these webinars for you to get the word out. Um, really appreciate all the work that you've done. And um, the contact information for everybody, I think, is on the screen. Maybe not. No, it's in the profile. So if you go to the project profile or when the email comes out, you'll get that as well. But without, without uh, anything else, I think um, I want to thank you all and, and have a great day. And please let us know if you have any questions. All righty.